I'm Devin Banerjee, and joining me now is Tom Fink. Tom is the CEO of Bearings. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. So, Tom, Bearings appears to be in quite an expansion mode, looking at new geographies, new asset classes. Talk about those geographies sure. and asset classes you're looking to expand into and why. So, ultimately, uh, we are a global firm already in 16 countries and fairly well balanced between the U.S., Asia, and Europe. That said, uh, a lot of what we invest in from fixed income to high yield to credit alternatives, uh, we do in the U.S., we do in Europe, but we want to grow a lot of those things in Asia too, you know, like investing in real estate. Uh, we do do equities locally in places like Hong Kong and Korea, uh, recently moved into Shanghai. Our basic view is this. The money is growing all over the world and it's globalizing. So if we have the presence across the globe with institutional and wealth investors, we will be able to succeed in helping them invest through the globe. Yeah. So Tom, you oversee the direction of about $320 billion mm -hmm. in assets. Talk about valuations, let's say in, in, in the equity market, in the US and globally. What, what's your sense of where we are in that cycle right now? I don't know if it's a cycle or, or an unending, you know, sort of narrative about when are we going to fall down. You know, we saw a lot of uh, stress in the fourth quarter last year uh, across not just equity but in, in other asset classes like credit. That was probably a good thing because I think in developed markets it, it took a little steam out of it. But of course, here we are. We're through the first quarter. Equity markets are rallying again. If I take the lens back and say, okay, where's the most value? Well, we're constantly investing in different markets, but at times you can look at and say, if emerging market equities, for instance, in debt, have been lower for longer, they probably have more upside in the near term uh, than maybe developed markets. That said, you, know, you, have, you, have, or you have to invest, right? You can't sit right. in cash. So Tom, you mentioned you operate globally. We've seen geopolitics play maybe an increasing role in markets globally. Do you think it's time for all investment professionals to have some understanding, some grasp of geopolitics now? It is so important. It's interesting. Uh, um, a year ago, we hired a gentleman, Dr. Christopher Smart, to essentially launch, which we just recently launched, the Bearings Investment Institute. And the focus of that was, while we had great expertise across our asset classes and, and sort of the fundamentals of markets, the fundamentals, uh, uh, economic fundamentals, we needed to have uh, more input or, or share our thought leadership about the geopolitical and about those macro issues with our clients. And we needed to give them more value. So, you know, yeah, I think now more than ever, we're still fundamental bottoms up investors but we have to understand the dynamics of the geopolitics and making those decisions better. Let's home in, if you don't mind, on a couple major geopolitical issues sure. uh, facing the markets these days. Um, the U.S.-China trade agreement, we've heard pretty continuously that we're close to it. We've heard here at this conference from members of the, of the U.S. administration yeah. that we're getting closer. D do you have a sense or what, or what, what role does does that potential agreement even play in markets right now? I would say, do I have a sense how close they are or not? No. I mean, I'm, I'm an observer from the sidelines, uh, and probably the, the, the people you've talked to have a better sense of that. Do I hope they resolve it? Yes. Do I think it's a distraction from businesses being able to be more purposeful in investing? It has to be. When, you, when you're not sure what the rules will be, it's going to impact you know, the decisions you make as businesses or investing in markets. So I, I hope they get a framework done, um, and hopefully it'll be soon. Let's touch on an, another geopolitical political issue these days. The Brexit process is continuing. It's, 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 yeah. it's been delayed, pushed back a bit, but still on people's minds. Yeah. Do you see effects of, of that process in, in the markets you operate in? Well, certainly it's had an effect uh, in particular in the UK and European markets. Uh, so for instance, a lot of firms like ourselves, we had to say, okay, what's our assumption? And, and you know, we assume a hard Brexit. We don't want a hard Brexit, but you prepare for the worst, right? 
And uh, if that does occur, um, we're prepared. You know, I, I think the market probably has absorbed it. A lot of markets, equity markets, for instance. So uh, it's really just getting over with, frankly, at right. this point. It's like, let's go one way or the other. Tom, in addition to directing $320 billion in assets, you also lead hundreds, I think thousands of employees at Bearings. In addition to being in expansion mode, mm -hmm. Bearings appears to also be in a transformation mode after its bankruptcy and subsequent reemergence <laughs> two, two decades ago. How do you lead a firm going through that, that, that transformation while still retaining some of the long heritage yeah. of Bearings? And what advice would you give to leaders in that well, same situation? The new Bearings was created in 2016 when we merged actually four subsidiaries of Mass Mutual, our parent company. Uh, there was Bearing Asset Management, which you're correct, was the piece that survived uh, the collapse of the bank in 1994 that Mass Mutual acquired uh, in 2005. But there, were, there was uh, Babson, which I have been right. running since uh, 2008, it was actually the bigger entity. When we put the companies together, we did it for a number of reasons. One, it brought together a nice diversified group of investment capabilities. Legacy bearings had global equities. Uh, Babson was very well known for its fixed income, right. real estate, uh, and alternatives. We took the bearings name for a reason. One, it does have that heritage. You know, the bearings name goes back over 250 years. It's been part of the narrative of the financial history of, of the world, not just you know, Europe and, and the U.S. So. Uh, when I look at Bearings today, the trends we're really about is serving our global client base and being able to deliver them not just products but solutions across fixed income, equity markets, and private asset markets. But I, I guess my question was culturally, mm -hmm. how do you ensure that when you're bringing entities together, yeah. everyone's on board with the same mission and vision? You got to be clear. Uh, and, and part of this was when we did it internally and we brought everybody together, he said, this is the goal. We're going to lean into these trends. We're going to build a great global diversified asset manager. And, and, uh, and, and it's about character. You know, we have uh, 2,100 employees. 40% are outside the U.S. We're not an American firm. We're a global firm. And so culture, we're multicultural. You know, uh, we have our, our teams in Hong Kong and Korea and Europe. It's multicultural. But character is the same. Serve the client, perform, and, and really respect each other as teammates. If you carry those values and you get a common goal, you can get through this integration. Tom, a question from our audience. We're seeing a rise of data science and data capabilities yeah. at investment management operations. Similar to my question about geopolitics, do you think all investment professionals should now have some grasp of how to work with data and effectively be many data scientists? Uh, yes, I don't know that they have to be data scientists, but data is very important. It's always been important, especially when you look at, uh, you know, we're in a lot of private markets, like private equity, right. real estate, and we've been capturing data for years. Now the tools are getting more powerful. Right? So now you can do more with that data. And AI, in essence, is the ability to use that data and maybe draw new inferences or get new signals from that data. Um, so yeah, it is, it is important part of your strategy, technology, and, and, and not just the data, but the digital strategy, how you interact with your client uh, is very important. And it will augment the analyst's role, if you think about it. It's not replacing the analyst, but now they're more powerful. Just like when they were able to get spreadsheets on PCs 35, 40 years ago, it changed how effective and productive the investor can be. Right, Tom, you mentioned private markets. We've seen assets in private markets swell mm -hmm. um, a lot yeah. in the past decade. Um, well, do you think that will continue? I think it will. I think post-crisis, what you saw is, a, is one, uh, an increase in flow of money around the globe. You know, so a lot of money, whether it's coming out of Australia, Asia, Europe, US, was going the other way around. So right. Some of it's just uh, the big institutions looking to diverse away from their home markets, if you will. Two, you, know, you see 
dramatic growth in pockets of institutional money from several wealth funds to superannuation funds and the growth of, of wealth in, in places like China. So, yes, you're going to, part of why the money is going into private markets is as public and low yields, low returns, as alpha is harder to get out of uh, the more liquid markets, you see more interest going into private markets where there is a premium to the public markets. And on the equity side in the public markets, is it a function of fewer IPOs, fewer companies choosing to be public companies and yeah. finding private capital to stay private longer? I think the, the, you know, the, the classic private equity capital had a mode of you know, buy two, three years, flip it out in IPO, and I, I do think that's shifted a lot. If a lot of institutional investors are saying, look, I want to own the cash flow or the earnings of that company longer. Right. So you're starting to see much longer, uh, if you will, structures in terms of ownership. And in many respects, if there's enough capital, the company can grow, stay private and grow, somewhat of an advantage because they can think long term versus short term with, a, with the right type of ownership. Tom, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Devin.